really need to get together and let our voices be heard. This is Buffalo What's Next. I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget Jaipal Valenza. I'm Dave Debo. And I'm Thomas O'Neill White. After May 14th, how can we afford not to talk about race? About education, about segregation, about humanity. Since the dawn of this nation, racial violence has existed. The way we have designed our society has a big hand in what occurred in that Tops Market. The suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. We need to make sure that we put more funding in our programs that help prevent gun violence and more money into art. If we're going to have some real healing, we've got to have space to tell some uncomfortable truths. And good morning. This is Dave Debo. Today, for the entire hour, we're going to talk about restorative justice. Well, what's that, Dave, you ask? Believe me, uh, we will explain it before the hour is done. And we have two experts who are bringing it to local schools here to talk about it. Dina Thompson is here. She's the executive director. And Debbie Mulhern, the school specialist for the Erie County Restorative Justice Coalition. What is that? We'll, un- we'll unspool this all as the program unfolds. But basically, I think we can describe it as an alternative system of discipline in various schools using community circles, using talking, using conflict resolution in a really unique and different way. And the reason why it's been deployed in a lot of places, including here around Buffalo, is to address something called the school-to-prison pipeline, the idea that suspensions are oftentimes statistically uh, inflicted more against black students than whites, and then that sends them in a spiral off to the community, out of school, dropping out of school, maybe into crime and into prison, the school-to-prison pipeline. We'll get into all of this as the program uh, unfolds. Dina and Debbie, thanks for being here. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Let's start with the pipeline. Let's mm-hmm. start with some of the, the reasons why restorative justice is a thing. And we'll, we'll describe what it is. We'll talk about your healing circles in a little bit. But I wanted to first just look at the scope of the problem. Students in Western New York, especially in the city of Buffalo, are suspended more often if they're black. Um, This is true, Um, and not just locally, but nationally. Uh, Students of color are suspended 3.5 times more than their white counterparts, and often it's for the same offense. So if they do something once, they're suspended more than once for it? Um, so if they do something once, or they usually get a suspension for that particular offense. Um, and if they're, which is what we're seeing statistically, if they repeat the same offense, they are, again, suspended. Um, and so what we see in the data is that we see uh, one student being suspended multiple times um, for the same offense, but it might happen at different times. Mm-hmm. And what this tells us is that suspension is not necessarily working because we're seeing the reoccurring problem of the students being suspended for the same behavior. So we're not addressing the underlying issues that is causing the behavior, just the behavior. So it's not discipline. Um, it is is restorative practice discipline? No, or? no, uh, suspension. I mean, uh, suspension is um, it's a discipline that is sort not currently of. working. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I, I guess we're saying the same thing. Mm-hmm. If, if if I am suspended. As a disciplinary measure, you would think that that would prevent me from doing it again. Well, um, what suspension does is it removes a person um, from the environment when they need the environment most. Um, And so we're asking uh, a student to be removed from a place of education um, where they are fed, uh, where they have safety. And um, we're asking them to go home and think about the behavior, the challenging behavior that they're disciplined displaying without any resources to change the behavior. And here's some of the numbers from the Education Trust New York. Schools disproportionately suspended black students in 2016-17, according to numbers from the State Education Department. In Buffalo Public Schools, 47% of the enrollment are black students. But that represents 65% of all the students who were suspended at least once. 45% of the population makes up 65% of the suspensions. Clearly, something's 
Not right, you would say. Yes. Um, and um, I'm going to let Debbie kind of uh, chime in here as well. Um, I, and I just want to say, like, there are underlying conditions that cause behavior. And if we look statistically um, at our region, we know that we have the fourth highest um poverty rate for our, our youth. Um, we also have one of the highest um, of large cities homelessness rates for our youth. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later, but we're looking if we're looking at the impoverished uh, neighborhoods um, that our students are coming from, we know that all adds to the underlying c- conditions that can cause challenging behavior. So Debbie, come on in. What, what do you do in the schools? How does this play out? What do you see? Um, what I'm seeing right now is teachers and administration who want to do things differently, but they're not really sure how, and they're still reacting instead of responding. So I just left teaching a year ago to join this team because I didn't like, when I started doing this, I liked the, per- the teacher that I became, but it's a practice. And they're impatient. They want to change. The, they think they have to change the kids instead of themselves. And that's the thing. We have to change ourselves as adults, how we're responding to kids, and to understand and appreciate cultural differences. And when we're looking in the schools, it is a majority white teachers, and you have a large population of children of color. You have a lot of refugees. You have a lot of um, immigrants. And they respond. We're reacting instead of saying, "How can we do things differently?" Because th- the higher ups have put down this sense of urgency. Reduce suspensions. Okay. Well, we don't. They don't know how. Ah. Mm. So that's that's where you go into the classes and you teach them how to do this. Correct. Yes. I, I, I hesitate to use this analogy, but I think anyone who's been through pet training, they mm. always say. It's not the dog. It's not the cat. It's the person that needs to retrain. Mm. Similarly, and I, I, by no means do I want to put, make students animals, mm-hmm. but similarly, the onus is on the people who are in charge of the discipline. Correct. And then to me, as adults, we have to learn how to talk to each other first. Mm-hmm. And the adults also have to be healed. The adults have to learn a different way to talk, to respond to each other, and not to take everything personally. Just think of, okay, I'm going to meet you where you are. Meet, please meet me where I am. And if we start there, then it'll cycle down to the students. But we can't go in there and say, well, I learned this new thing. We're going to do a circle, and the kids don't understand it. And they're bouncing all over the place. And then teachers are like, ah, I give up. This doesn't work. Well, ah, it, it doesn't does. work because you didn't. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, it's, so let, let's let's um, I, I love about um, restorative practice because it does lift up the value of grace. And mm-hmm. so in that, when we're asking teachers to um, implement a restorative practice strategy, um, it's a whole school model, which means that everyone in a school has an opportunity to practice restorative practice. Restorative practice is practicing how to to be in community with each other, everyone who is in the school community, including parents, including students, including the adults that are in the building. So it's not just an offender who was pulled out and no. put in a special program, restorative justice over here. It's a template for discipline in the entire school. It's, it's, it's a, just, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's, so the justice part of restorative justice is the discipline part. The practice is how are we practicing to be in good relationships with each other? How are we building community? How are we getting to know each other um, so that we can create these strong, positive relationships that build strong, positive communities? And if we're investing 80% of our time into these positive relationships, we will have to invest less time in the discipline portion because when we create safety um, in a place I want to be in that place so I'm less likely to harm a place that I want to be in that's a lot bigger than I pictured it being if it's designed to um, change suspensions, mm-hmm. I pictured it working specifically with an offender who could be suspended. No. You're talking about an entire classroom here. Correct. We're talking the about an entire, entire school. district. School. Wow. <laughs> entire city, entire nation. <laughs> How does it work? 
Um, so um, so I, I will say one of our, our biggest partners is Buffalo Public Schools. Um, and Buffalo Public Schools also have invested in trainers within their school district. So they do have restorative practice trainers that train in that, trauma-informed care, social-emotional learning. Um, we are one of the community-based partners that come alongside them. And we train people in the dialogue language of how to connect relationally. And so that the most formal part of that is what a lot of people talk about is restorative circles is when we sit down in this formal um, way and we build values and guidelines of how we will interact and engage with each other. Um, we create what we call prompts or, or questions to build community to find out how we are more alike than we are different. And um, through that, we kind of create this school culture. Um, restorative practice is not something that we move in and out of. It's a part of who we are. So restore people, restore people. And if we're constantly investing in restoring each other, building relationships, um, creating relationships, maintaining relationships. And then when a conflict of occurs, there's a process in that called restorative justice of when we get to the discipline part or alternatives to discipline, really, it's, we, it's when we bring the people who have been most impacted by a particular situation or conflict or behavior together to have a dialogue about what happened, what were you thinking at the time, what have you thought about since, who's been impacted by what happened, and then now what do you need to do to make things right so that we can reintegrate people back into community in a healthy way. And this is done in a circle with the entire classroom? So, um, one, yes, the restorative practice is always done in a classroom. It's also done in teacher meetings. It's also done in um, every aspect of the, of the school. So circles can happen with academic circles. Um, we can come together and learn a lesson in a circle. Um, cultural competency can be done in a circle. So a, a it's a culture. more than an event. I was looking at the right. circle as like an event, but that's not what you're saying. No. 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 So... Um, when I got on, when I started doing this, I started practicing it in my classroom before I felt any confidence doing this out in a larger community. And it really was about building the, commu the community of my own classrooms, right? So we sat in a circle, and it would be just super simple questions like, how are you doing? If you were a superhero, what superhero would you be? You know, and then, you know, what are your goals for this year? What are your challenges for this year? Doing just basic check-ins. And in the beginning, seven minutes of my classroom was always a check-in. How are you doing? And just a simple question. And then we would get into the academics. And I started to run my classroom in, academically in, in a circle. What I saw was I wasn't yelling. If a child acted out anymore, we had signals because I could see everybody were sitting in a circle. They could go take a walk instead of me kicking them out of a class, mm -hmm. right? I wasn't writing up discipline referrals anymore. And I was not correcting behaviors throughout the entire period anymore. What grade level are we talking about here? I taught fifth through eighth grade, all boys. Wow. East side Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked, and they loved it. And I even would, ha I had a group who, just before I left, um, and before they knew I was leaving, who ran into my class after, um, their PE class and said, we need to circle up. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I have another class. And they said, oh, we already took care of that. We told our teacher to take that class. We got to come in with you and circle. And we did. Mm. Um, and I didn't miss any instructional time because I was saving so much time from correcting behaviors. But, and I, I kind of want to comment because um, we keep talking about uh, the circle aspect of restorative practice. Restorative practice is a, is a continuum of practice. It's not just a formal part of sitting in a circle. That is the most formal part that takes the most amount of time and the most amount of planning. Restorative practice is also about how are we addressing each other on a one-on-one. -on -one. You know, how can we be accountable and responsible for our behavior? How do we greet people when we see people? How do we, um, what we call, have small impromptu to um, conferences or conversations when we see um, a behavior or even a celebration. So it can be a challenging behavior or it can be a celebration. When we see that occurring, how do we um, engage with that in a positive way? So again, that's where it's more of a technique than, mm -hmm. than the circle being an event. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to say 
It's more than a technique. It's a lifestyle. Tell me it's more. a lifestyle. So we, as I said before, restore people, restore people. If I'm in a constant mode of restoring, repairing, and creating these relationships, everyone I engage in will be a practice of a relationship. Um, and so this isn't just something that we do um, as our profession. It's the way we live. This is the only work you should be able to take home. Mm-hmm. It is how um, I nurture my family. Um, it is how I nurture my friendships. It's how I nurture people that are co-workers um, at work. So we don't just practice this in um, our, our partnerships. We also practice this as an organization. So we have values. We have guidelines within our organization. We have a way, because guess what? We are just, we're people, and yeah. this is restorative practice, not restorative perfect. And so sometimes we have conflict at work, and when we have a conflict at work, we use this practice to come to the underlining meaning and come to an agreement um, at the end. So our conflict is resolved resolved, not just that conflict, but the relationship is also healed in the process. Which I'm going to say in normal situation, well, I'm not going to say normal. I'm going to say abnormal situations, (laughs) which is most of society right now. Yeah. When there's a conflict, we don't, you don't have a trust built. Whereas here, if I'm feeling something, I know that I can trust on Dean. I can trust Dina. Dina knows she can trust me, where we can come to each other because we have built that relationship. We might need something, run into each other's offices and say, hey, and before we go to the, oh yeah, wait, how are you? And we check in with each other. You know, how, how's it going? You know, anything just to check in before we before we address what whatever fire we're trying to put out. Mm-hmm. So, and that just builds that relationship relationship and um I do it at home. Mm-hmm. You know, and my kids at first thought I was a hippie freak and now they like it. <laughs> they appreciate it. They said you don't yell ever. And I mm-hmm. said why? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I don't need to. Mm-hmm. I want to try and explore the, what that looks like in the classroom mm. okay. because taking the extra time to do that stuff presumably takes away from education time. What's the balance? What does that look like? So in the typical classroom, you have kids that come in, the teachers many times sitting at their desk trying to get ready Mm -hmm. or standing at the front waiting for the students to come in, and it's chaos. With this, you stand at the door, you greet the students one by one, right? They sit down. In a perfect world, I would love if it was always set up in a circle for every academic in a perfect world. But even if they don't, you're greeted, you say hello, And then instead of constantly saying, okay, open to page 40, you do just a quick check-in, you know, just to see where everybody is. You might have somebody, I might have a child who gets off the bus, and there may have been chaos either on the bus or at home, or they didn't have breakfast, or they were hungry. If your inarguable truth is you're hungry, guess what? I've got granola bars in my desk. Mm -hmm. But if (laughs) if you're taking time to talk to Joey about the granola bar that he needs, you're not giving Jane or, or Jill. But I am because they all have a voice. All right. They all have an opportunity to talk, right? And they know. And, and they know that they have that opportunity to say, I'm hungry. And during the check-in, if you're like, the, even if I do a fist of five, if you're two, what's going on? I'm hungry. Uh, uh, right. Explain that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fist to five is, if it's a fist, I'm not doing well. Any number of f- fingers between one to five. One, not so good. Five, I'm doing awesome. So a one or a two, those are the kids that I'm going to look at and think, okay, when I have a second, I'm going to go address them, right, and get everybody else started so I'm not losing my curriculum time, but I also know there are people that I need to check in with, right? I'm just going to – I'll say – Kids um, who need attention will get attention one way or another. Mm -hmm. Um, And Uh so if we give them an opportunity to have positive engagement, then you will spend less time disciplining uh, students in the classroom. This is where... um, If I'm noticing him or her he or she doesn't have to act out. That's right. Yeah. And so this particular time in the classroom gives an opportunity for every student to be seen and heard. Everyone shows up to be seen and heard. Um, and so I'll just say one school we work um, with in Buffalo Public School is um, School 43. Um, so I'm just going to give them a, a shout out. Um, and in that school, we worked with them for a year. And uh, the principal, who is just uh, fantastic, um, put in the schedule 20 
minutes a day for circle. So she made it a priority within her school to have 20 minutes a day. And I know many schools in the Buffalo Public Schools, we also work with Chicatawango Sloan School District, has designed and put this time in their day to check in with students. And because of that, at School 43, they saw a 50% decrease in office discipline referrals without addressing discipline and a 50% decrease in suspensions without looking at suspensions. The key point was creating relationships in the schools between staff and also between peers. How is that different from what typically goes on? Because um, I've been out of high school for a couple, <laughs> a, a decade or two, mm -hmm. and uh, I can remember the concept in our school, uh, suburban district, was you had the same homeroom for four years. Mm -hmm. You had that opportunity for the, the teacher to check in mm. before you moved off to the academic areas and the other classes. Um, I didn't think at the time, in the context of what you guys are saying, that it was a circle per se, mm -hmm. but it sounds as if it sort of did that purpose. Um, are schools doing this without really knowing it? How, how does formalizing it as restorative justice, Dina is here from the coalition, um, differ from just basic practice? So I, I'm just going to say um, school is very different. Uh, the world is very different from when we were um, in, in schools. Um, there's a lot more uh, stress in the world. Um, I don't know if it's more stress or we have access to know that there's more stress in the world. Um, there are distractions like um, social media um, that add to stress and anxiety of our young people. Um, there is the COVID pandemic um, that we just went through, racial tension that we're feeling in this country, um, the increase, as I said before, in, in poverty. And so I think um, the the pressure of rigor in the classroom, um, all of those things, I think, add to a change of how we are addressing our students and not seeing them as people, but more as an academic score. Mm. And so I think that is the shift of, of education right now. And we need to take that, that long look and say, uh, our students, do not share unless they know you care. And we need to create that as a priority in the classroom. We know that social emotional learning with the gap that we've seen through the COVID pandemic, that two and a half years has put our, our children uh, 10 years behind social emotional. So we will see the impacts of students being um, out of school and learning virtually for two and a half years. We'll see that impact the next 10 years. And so one thing that we saw and a lot of people saw when students actually went back to school was that our our children were, were technically two and a half years behind. Um, and so when you were in fifth grade, when you left school in fifth grade and you came back in seventh grade, you were um, uh, approached as a seventh grader, but really social emotionally, you were still a fifth grader. So we have these grand, huge expectations of our students without connecting with them relationally. And so we need to, to go back to doing that. Now, as you said, this isn't anything that is new. It is old. Um, restorative practice is not. actually <laughs> an indigenous Practice. Yeah, yeah. This is an indigenous practice. This is nothing that's new that's coming up. We're taking something that's old and we're bringing it to the future um, because this is what our students need to actually succeed as, a, as, as adults. Dina Thompson is here. She's executive director. Debbie Mulhern here is the school specialist for the Erie County Restorative Justice Coalition. We've got a lot more to come. We're going to talk a little bit about standardized testing, some of the pressure on students. Obviously, the impetus for this entire program is to look at some of the Community issues around 514. We'll touch on community as well. Much more to come. Stay with us. This is Buffalo What's Next. PBS Kids fun and educational content is available wherever you are in Western New York, whenever you want. Live stream the channel at wned.org slash pbskids. And while you're there, you can play games, watch videos from your favorite shows like Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, Molly of Denali, and Alma's Way. And you'll find resources for parents and teachers. Visit wned.org slash pbskids today. This is Buffalo What's Next, where we have conversations with the community about moving forward. To have your voice heard, press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app, and we'll work to get your questions and comments on the air. Join us on Twitter at WBFO or email us at news at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. 
This is Dave Debo. We are talking today with Dina Thompson, the executive director, and Debbie Mulhern, the school specialist for the Erie County Restorative Justice Coalition. If you've just joined us, you, you might not have heard what they said earlier about how it's a technique, it's a practice, it's a way of approaching the way people interact in schools so that there is a little bit more sharing there is a little, I, I don't want to say less discipline, but is it appropriate to maybe say that? Um, it's a different approach to discipline. All right. And, and part of the reasons for doing it is because of the school to prison pipeline. Again, some of the statistics in the Erie County, uh, uh, and this is the entire county now, not just Buffalo, in all of Erie County, uh, the black students were 5% of the enrollment. But in all of Erie County, not counting Buffalo, they represent 21% of the students who were suspended at least once. So there is this national concept called the school to prison pipeline. It means that suspensions could lead to prison. And let's try to figure out a different way to approach things so that, that suspensions happen less. How many schools are you in? Um, currently, we are in 12 schools. Um, Deb, you yes. want to tell us a little bit about the schools? Sure. With Buffalo, um, we started last year um, with a cohort of Buffalo schools, Lydia T. Wright, which this year has adopted Circle Up. Um, they are slaying circling. <laughs> they're, they're doing it really well. I go and observe them. Um, I'm really proud of them. Um, Charles Drew Academy, we're working with them. Um, they also are building this into their schedule. East High School and 131. Um, both of those schools, they have it built into their time. Um, 131 has Snug coming in during their lunchtime. As what? Um, Snug. What is that? It's an organization, one of our community partners. We can talk about, I don't even remember what they stand for, but they were through um, ECMC to stop gun violence. Oh. Okay. So it's an organization All to right. stop that, and we love them. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, East has started where they're going to be doing East High School during homerooms. They're dedicating time every day to circle up with their kids and just see how they're doing and with each other. And that's one thing that we're stressing also is that the adults have also been through trauma, especially in the last few years. So to also change the way we are with each other, you know, instead of, hey, how's it going? Actually stopping and looking at each other in the eye. And that's, you know, to build the community and to build the trust amongst every person in the building. And I definitely want to get to that <laughs> as the program unfolds here. Because I think if, if we're talking about the things that Buffalo needs right now, if we're talking about whether it went through with the top shooting on 514, that, yeah, a sense of community, mm -hmm. a sense of sharing has got to be part of the discussion. But mm -hmm. tell me about the other schools. Uh, you have Cheek Dwaga in Cheek there. Cheek Dwaga Sloan. Um, they've been working with us for this several years. This will be their years, fourth, fourth year, year. Um, wow. with us. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And then um, we have Westminster Charter School, um, which they tracked with us for a little bit before, and now they um, have just signed with us to work with us even more, and they already have things built into their system. Um, we have trained with Grand Island, um, Fredonia, Genesee Valley, BOCES, um, Tapestry Charter School. Sorry, I almost forgot you guys, um, <laughs> <laughs> but not to. Um, and um, we're also now working on building a relationship with other Chictawaga schools um, mm -hmm. with the districts mm -hmm. um, in there to build a cohort with them. How, how does that happen? Do you just knock on their door, Dina, and say, hey, let me explain this to you and bit by bit develop a relationship that allows Debbie to walk in the door? Um, well, uh, well, with our Buffalo Public Schools, we are um, part of the Community Foundation's um, Racial Justice Equity Roundtable. Mm -hmm. And through that, coming together, um, addressing um, some of the issues, the racial issues that we're seeing in the city, um, they have sponsored Buff um, Erie County Restorative Justice Coalition to partner with um, Buffalo Public Schools for this initiative. And so mm -hmm. we looked at um, some schools that we should be working with and out of suggestion of Buffalo Public Schools, these are the schools that they chose um, for us to track with. And um, so that's how that relationship went. Um, the other schools, they, they call us. They are interested in restorative practices. We also do community-based training, and uh, a lot of times schools will send um, a, a sample of their um, 
their staff uh, to some of our community-based training. The staff uh, get really excited about the training and they want to expand it more within their school system. And then usually a school would, would call us and, and we would do it. We only take around about 12 schools um, a year per year. So we don't really kind of go um, outside of that number just because of that's about all we can uh, handle for an implementation yeah. plan. We're usually tracking with schools um, anywhere from two to four years. Um, our, our goal is to uh, have schools be able to turnkey this themselves. Um, and so they work with us for four years. It does take three to five years to implement. Four, by the fourth year, we um, hope that schools can turnkey this and then just kind of keep the momentum going within their own school system. And full disclosure, you mentioned the Racial Equity Roundtable. We are a media partner of them through our Racial Equity Reporting Initiative that uh, takes place here in the newsroom. Um, do you knock on a school's door and they open it wide? Or I guess what I really need to ask, Debbie, is how does it look where the rubber hits the road? When teachers are beginning to learn this, do they like it? I would say it's about a third, a third, a third. You have a third of the teachers full buy-in. They cannot wait. They want to do this. You have a third that aren't really sure, but they're open to it. And then you have about a third who are, I'm not doing this. Kids don't have any. They're just, they're, you're just letting them get away with everything. But then we start to see even the ones that push back the hardest, they start to melt. Mm -hmm. But it takes time. Like Dana was saying, it's it's a three to five year thing. And it's voluntary. The, the major thing about restorative practices, restorative justice, is that it's voluntary. So when you force somebody to sit in on the classes or you're forcing somebody to do it, and they don't understand the process and they haven't seen it. And they, there are some people, I need to see it to believe it, mm -hmm. right? Once they start to see it is, once they, is when they start to buy in. So if we can get that third that's all in to really model it throughout the school, those that are on the fence, they're gonna, they're gonna fall into it and they're gonna say, oh my gosh, I love this. And then you're gonna start to see the stragglers saying, mm -hmm. okay, wait, how come the nobody? How come you don't write anybody up? I never hear you yelling anymore, mm -hmm. you know. Or how come this, you know? But the key is really communication, 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 so that when a student is being sent out of a room, that they communicate back to the teacher that instead of suspending, that they have supports in place, and that's the key to it. If that teacher doesn't know, they feel like okay, well, I don't matter when they do. So it's giving everybody a voice, and it's making sure that they, the communication is open, timely, um, and, you know, they start to see it works, and it's a much happier building to walk into. A little bit mm -hmm. earlier, you said that a lot of your work as a teacher when you first started trying this out was grade 5 through 8, and that surprises me, because I can, I, I can see this working easily, almost automatically, in kindergarten, where part of what you're doing is teaching kids what school is all about. They'll right. embrace it because it's just part of what's set in front of them. Fifth through eighth graders, Fifth. they're a little um, more independent, shall we say. Mm -hmm. They're independent, but they still want to be seen and heard. I went into schools after, even after the shooting. I went into McKinley. I didn't know a kid. I ran a circle. I had kids that were talking, and teachers walked out with me and said, I can't believe you got them to open up like You're that. You're talking about the shooting at McKinley, not No, no, not no. Tops. I'm talking after the tops. After tops. Okay. Yes. And and I had these they said these kids aren't even gonna talk. They were a tough group, you know, six one one kids, and they opened up and we had a great conversation for an hour and a half. Let me back up. Six one one? Um, it's six students to two teachers. Oh, okay. They're right. usually the kids that get into trouble more gotcha. often or they okay. might have academic um, more ac more academic needs so you know but these were tough kids and they opened up and i've but any school that we walk into you know one of our partners um cheris she walks in mm -hmm. she'll kids are like a can't they will open up to anybody as long as they feel seen and heard and that is the and feedback safe. and safe and, and i met a kid um at the gay program who I did a circle with at Charles Drew at Saturday Academy. He was not going to sign up to partner with us and to get trained or do, get in, any involvement. And then he saw me and he said, I remember you. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, she's cool. 
Mm. And I met him once. We did one circle. And at the end of that, they said, I felt like you, you really cared. You trust, we trust you. You cared about us and you listened to us. And really that's all kids want. It doesn't matter what age, Mm -hmm. you know, and you can build a relationship very quickly if you're actually looking somebody in the eye and you're giving them the time to speak. You know, I just wanted to comment. I feel, I feel like, um, there's, there's kind of two things happening. Um, one thing is we, we have the opportunity to speak with um, a lot of teachers and teachers want to do this. The pressure is the time. Like you keep pointing that out. Yeah, exactly. The time to do I this. I wonder about that. It is the academic pressure of of the standardized testings, the academic pressure of everything that they have to accomplish in the classroom that makes it challenging for this to happen. Good teachers go into this profession because they want to help students succeed. Um, and I think that sometimes of those pressures that they have from um, the system um, doesn't allow them to to offer this. But once they um, once they experience it in a very authentic way, uh, meaning that I don't feel the pressure of doing this, once they are able to engage in this in a very authentic way, I know that t- that teachers. Um, really embrace uh, this practice. And they embrace it in a culture of a way because there's a lot of research out there that say when teachers and adults in the be- in the building are doing restorative practice with each other, out of the overflow of that, of them being seen and heard, their classrooms are better. Mm. So our philosophy is like, this is more for the adults in the, bu- in the building than it is for the students in the building because they are our needs because we as adults show up to be seen and heard as well. And we want to be our best selves in the classroom. So if you're offering this in a very authentic way, it means that we're not doing this just with students, but we're also offering this to each other and really authentically checking in uh, with each other in the building as well. And I teased you before the break. I did want to ask you about standardized testing. You're probably Mm -hmm. not a fan. Um, I'm not a fan. And this is very interesting because, um, uh, because of 514, um, our students did not take um, the Regents um, exam testing. Yeah. And it's because some of the questions on it could have been triggering for mm. our students. And so in that particular incident, if it would have been triggering for our students, why are they on the test in the beginning? Um, which for me makes a, the test not culturally sensitive. Um, it doesn't embrace culture and the learning of that in a test. It teaches it to the dominant culture uh, within um, our society. And so therefore, in the beginning for me is not fair um, in the beginning. It also does not allow teachers the freedom um, to teach in a way that might um, expand learning, um, that critical thinking that our students need to do in order to succeed. And so um, I'm a firm believer um, that teachers um, know their classrooms, they know their students in the classroom, and they should be able to teach accordingly. I've got to believe that Buffalo is not the only place doing this. How do we fit in that national picture? Uh, a leader, uh, someone that's uh, doing a lot of it, but not as much as other places? Where, where are we on that continuum? Um, you mean restorative practices? Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> is it, th- this is a nationwide movement. Uh, this is a. I, we just came from a national convention um, in July, and there's been some great work being done in Chicago. The uh, event was being um, done in Chicago. Um, Denver, Colorado, is probably my my north star for uh, people who are doing very well. It's not only in their school system, but also in their criminal justice system, and they raise funds for restorative practice initiatives in Colorado. Florida is another. Um, great place. Um, Pittsburgh um, is another shining star. New York City, Brooklyn. Um, If we want to, Oakland, California is uh, San Francisco, San Diego. I mean, there is just countless places who have uh, made restorative practices a priority. Um, For our uh, our area, I really believe that it should be initiative um, coming from New York State Ed um, and making this a priority uh, for furthering education and really listening to the voice and prioritizing the voices of students and families because we need to start looking at the underlying issues that are causing behavior and not just saying that our students are not good students. If I am not, if I don't have healthy food, as Debbie was saying, um, I'm not going to be a healthy student. So we need to look at the whole child um, and not just one particular part of the child, which is 
what we do look like, unfortunately, is the academic success. So mm-hmm. a child should be measured more by their academic success. And um, we need to incorporate more families um, into the education system. I want to talk more about community when mm-hmm. we come back from the break. But you said something that I have to follow up on before we take that break. In some places, Denver, I believe it was, it's part of the criminal justice system, not just schools. Oh, yes. What's that look like? Well, we are partnered with the DA's office and the um, Buffalo Police Department. Um, We are also um, doing a restorative practice implementation uh, initiative at the Youth Secure Center, Erie County Youth Secure Center. So what it looks like, it looks like a diversion program. So instead of incarceration, they are choosing a diversion program, bringing people most impacted by a crime to Together to have a discussion. Um, it's a victim uh, focused event, meaning the needs of the victim are the priority to feel safe and to for them to define what the justice looks like for them. And um, in that process, we come up with an agreement. Um, and in that agreement, if the agreement is fulfilled, um, justice is served for the, the victim. We call them the harmed person. And then um, justice is also fulfilled for the person who has harmed or the, the offender in that because the underlining issues are met, number one. They're is a competency a portion of that for the victim and the offender so they're both getting their tangible needs met and um, there is also the ability for the offender to be reintegrated back into community in a healthy way because they were truly allowed to pay community and the person who was most impacted by the crime back for the offense do you have a circle that includes both the offender and the harmed person? Yes, we're doing that right now. Face to face? Face to face. We have an ongoing program um, that that is is happening right now here in Buffalo, New York. Uh, It is the coolest thing you could experience. I I wonder what it looks like. (laughs) It is is great. Tell me a little bit more. What does that look like? How does that Mm. unfold? I've done it with youth, um, and the kid comes in, hoods up. (laughs) They're slouching in their seat, uh, grunting at you. By the time we're done checking in, they're sitting up because they realize people are interested in what they have to say. The harmed person feels they're heard because, let's face it, if somebody steals your car, if you send them to jail, nothing is being repaired for the person whose car car was stolen. Mm -hmm. How can we work on this so, A, you stop stealing cars, but really most importantly, how can I feel complete? Right. And sometimes it's not even monetarily. Sometimes it's I need you to get a job. And we've had people that have offered youth help. Mm -hmm. You know, how what can I do to help you? You know, so you don't steal cars, you know, and we always have community people there who can say, well, I can help you with job training. And we, what we do is we interview every single person. We pre-conference them and say we ask the the harmer. What are your interests? What is something? And then we make sure we have community members in there that can say, hey, I heard you like to make T-shirts and you want to sell them. Okay, I have this business. Let me show you how to do that. Mm. I think um, I think a beautiful part of this, and we talk about community and partnership um, in Buffalo, uh, a beautiful part of this is one of our partners is um, the district attorney's office. And the district attorney's office during COVID saw a uh, an issue with the increase of car theft. Um, and so they came to us and said, hey, what would this look like if we developed a program called um, that that addressed this actual um, this this increase in, in car theft, which allowed us them to refer cases to us through this introduction and through this invitation? We came up with a program called the three part series in which we bring um victim and offenders together, along with community people, as Debbie mentioned, to help uh, repair the harm and have people move forward. And um, so the first part is bringing people together, um, having this conversation. The second part is actually bringing young people and families and community members together with the police to talk about what does it look like to develop that relationship with police officers? What does it look like for you to be accountable and responsible for safety in your neighborhood, not just the police officers? Um, And And so we have this great big circle conversation with role plays in it. So the police department is part of our partners. And then the third part is that we're connecting the offenders with that competency piece. It could be mentoring. It could be job training. It could be um, getting them back in school. It could be um, mental health support. And so whatever they need, we are truly um, doing that social justice aspect of reintegrating people back into community in a healthy way. And if they succeed in this program, then their record is um, expunged. All right. 
you said a lot of things there that I want to follow up on. <laughs> the idea of repairing harm and moving people forward, mm. the idea of social justice, all of that takes on a separate relevance if we're talking about the incidents on 514. We'll mm. go there after this. Dina Thompson is here. She's the executive director of the Erie County Restorative Justice Coalition. Debbie Mulhern is also here. She's a school specialist with the coalition. More in a moment. This is Buffalo What's Next on WBFO. Donations come in many forms. A sustaining membership, a one-time gift, even that extra vehicle you no longer need. Learn more about the advantages of donating a vehicle. Here's how. Go to wned.org slash vehicles. Get all the trusted local news you need right to your inbox each weekday morning with the WBFO daily email. Visit wbfo.org to sign up today. This is Buffalo What's Next, where we have conversations with the community about moving forward. To have your voice heard, press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app, and we'll work to get your questions and comments on the air. Join us on Twitter at WBFO or email us at news at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. And we are talking about restorative justice with two representatives from the Erie County Restorative Justice Coalition. Dina Thompson's here. Debbie Mulhern is here. It's a program that is used in a lot of schools. It's a program that in some ways was developed to try and look at the school-to-prison pipeline and alternative ways of imparting discipline in schools. But if you look at it as more than just the circles in the schools, it's really the way people relate to each other. You've, you've said several times, Dina, the idea of building community, helping restore community. Let's bring it around to the top shooting of 514. What does the community need right now? Mm. And how can this sort of thing we've been talking about for the past 45 integrate into that? Mm-hmm. That's such a good question. Um, the community needs uh, healing. That, that is my favorite question on this program, by the way. What does the community <laughs> mm-hmm. need? Because I think we really need to explore what's what's left undone. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I'm almost started with something else. The community needs voice, first of all. Um, voice um, on the issues that are impacting them. I, I cannot speak for the whole community. I... I uh, it's a horrific thing, 514, that has happened um, to the east side community. But um, when we talk about community, I think any person that is a, a, a black person uh, living in Buffalo was impacted by that. So we, 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 we uh, that community looks very large to me. Um, so when we talk about what the community needs, uh, there is the social emotional need for healing and reconciliation. There's a physical need for rebuilding that community and not having just one supermarket there. Um, there is the need for uh, home ownership by the community members. There is the need for economic justice that needs to happen. Um, businesses that need to flourish um, in the community. Uh, more grocery stores, uh, retail stores. It needs a, a heavy investment within the community. Uh, I, I want to point out Jefferson Avenue is a great community. Uh, I was born and raised in Jefferson Avenue. Right? I grew yeah. up there. Uh-huh. Um, it, it, the, you want to talk about city of good neighbors? That is the, the, the city of good neighbors. And we saw that in the response, in, in the continual response to 514, how people came out and are still coming out um, in that community. is a re- It's a resilient community. Um, but there are a lot of needs in that community. There's needs for jobs in the community. It's needs for good schools in the community. Um, there's a need for more green space um, in the community. It's a need for less policing um, in that community and more investment. Um, the people there are the most Beautiful, loving, giving people, um, I feel, um, in the city. Um, but they need it, their voices heard um, because they have been the ones that mo- have been most impacted uh, by 514. And they need to be not just heard, but listened to. And there needs to be action that takes place so 514 won't happen again. Uh, there needs to be action that takes place uh, where there's more than one supermarket um, in that area. So we need to center the voice of people. That is what they need. And then there needs to be actionable steps about what they're requesting. And does everything else we've been talking about here, this idea of restorative justice in circles, play a role there? 
Well, what would happen if we just had one big circle and all the all the community comes together and talks about this? That is such a good question because um, we are actually part of the Resiliency Center uh, Steering Committee um, in which we're doing just that. So uh, currently we are having circles at the uh, Resource Council. The Resiliency Center will be located there. And we have uh, had our first circle so far with people who are present, not injured. We have two more circles uh, scheduled um, for that to happen. It is not a public event uh in particular, is is specifically for people who are present but not injured, um, and so we have two more events uh, coming up to hear their voice, and we're actually assessing their need through that. But there's also more uh, community-based circles planned: um, one for the community, one for business um, owners. Uh, there's circles planned for people who are first responders, um, both community members and um, our local. Uh, police and officials uh, who are there. There's or another circle planned for the uh, business owners who are there. And then there's a circle planned for the people of color who are most impacted um, by that to come together. Without telling me things that are private. I, I get what you said, that mm -hmm. this is not a public session. What can you share about the circles that have occurred already? Well, what happens there? What do people, what do people bring to the table, literally? Um, our first circle, they brought a lot of emotion. Um, there were many in the circles, um, and we we keep them small. So we have like um, eight people, uh, eight to ten people in each circle. So we had a number of them going on at the same time. And uh, this is the first time many of them have come together since the incident and shared their stories together. Um, so there was a lot of emotion um, in the first circle. There was also a sharing of some resources that they have received, but also the big gap of resources they need. And we always like to finish on like, how to move forward? How do you envision this community in the future and what needs to happen? What would you like to see here um, in the in this community in the future? So we ask those questions, assessing the need because we wanna bring those resources and build this community up um, the way they want to see it rebuilt. And just like in the, uh, the, the offender victim circle, um, does the future action spring from that circle? In, in the offender victim analogy mm -hmm. that you had earlier, you talk about, well, what is it like when someone steals your car? Gee, can you help him get a car again? Mm -hmm. In this particular circle, do you then have people in the circle say, yeah, I, I can help start a business or, yeah, uh, I can maybe carry somebody's groceries. Does the action portion, thoughts, prayers, mm -hmm. action, does the action portion spring from the circle or does it just become a recommendation for some other part of the community, politicians, outside groups, what have you? Um, so that's uh, another great question. Um, so there's a number of things that happen. The steering committee has several subcommittees within them, which are organizations that are, most of them, a lot of them are based right in the community. So there's a spiritual need, um, alternatives to intervention. Um, there is mental health um, in there and then unmet needs category. So all of these are based on individuals. They're based on organizations that help meet the needs of people. So when you say it does spring up, but it's springing up from the community and then we connect people with those resources based on the needs. So the action plan taps other people on the shoulders, yes. basically. And that's what community does, right? We tap each other on the shoulders and we meet each other's needs. Um, and so we resource each other. And that's what builds a community because you're building a relationship in that as well. In the final minutes here, I want to talk about what it looks like in schools and what it looks like in the community. How do we deal with racism? What kind of conversations have to occur? What kind of education has to occur? And I don't know which one of you wants to jump in first. Um, we do um, racial healing circles. We have the affinity circles. Um, I've been part of some um, with primarily white people um, because, let's face it, I'm not exactly a, a face of safety right now. Right. 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 So we really re we're really being very respectful of the community um, so that their voice they feel safe to express their voices. And um, and then you bring people together, right? Let people have their voices, let them have their time, and then slowly bring them together. Um, and that's the goal. Ultimately, we would love to just 
run circles randomly in the middle of a street if we have to, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> just to bring community to talk um, to each other so that we don't have something so horrible again. I I think um, uh, we talked earlier about this being an, an indigenous practice. Um, and so taking that out a step further, I look at um, the harms, the original harms of this country. When we look at the genocide or almost genocide of our indigenous people, um, we have not yet repaired that harm. When we look at the harm of stolen labor from a land and are still living on the prosperity of that stolen labor, and we haven't addressed that harm. And and we have built systems in our country based on those two harms. And so until we as a country begin to look back and try to repair those harms, we are still um, just building on this conversation in this circle format one circle at a time. And I think that is our philosophy is that when we're invited in to have these conversations, where they're be in organizations or in schools, in our criminal justice system or in the community, we're providing the space um, to do this. And we are now training about 25 more uh, facilitators to be able to facilitate these types of conversations in their organizations, in their spaces, in their families, so that uh, our, our, our goal is to make Circle City. So our whole city will be having circles around this topic and many other topics so that we can all move forward in a positive way. I'm not criticizing the process, but there's a part of it where I think it might fall apart. Uh, those who would come to a circle... Mm-hmm are those who know there is a problem or know that there needs to be discussion. How do you get the, the, the tacit racist from Arcade who does not know that he or she is racist, how do you get them to a circle? So, And I don't mean to pick on Arcade, generic example. Yeah, but well here- <laughs> Please no phone calls. <laughs> so so, so this, is, this is what we say, right? So when we do this, this is a practice, a way of being. And so I take me wherever I go. It doesn't have to be a sitting informal circle, right? It's a one-on-one conversation. It's a two-on-one conversation. It doesn't have to be a formal getting people to circle. It's me sitting at the family dinner table and having a conversation or setting up guidelines for conversation. And it could be um, at your Thanksgiving table, you have question cards on the table instead of talking about certain things and you just bring up that topic. So it's a natural way of being and of giving and engaging each other in a very positive way. It does not have to be that formal circle it's interesting you say that i've had others on this program say that uh that's not necessarily the job of black people your Mm. job is not to educate me my job is to become educated as a a a white person Mm -hmm. um i say i i'm i'm always me so when i bring myself into a space I'm black. So when I come into the space, I'm the black person in the room. It's not my job to educate you. It's my job just to be me. And out of me, I am walking education. Um, And so as I'm walking and I'm in a space, my whole being is educating you on what does it mean to be black just by having a conversation with me. Contact. More more interaction than you're saying. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's that's the key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the key. Debbie, uh, we we, we were talking about (laughs) Selena Dina here. Jump on in. Well, first of all, her presence, yes. She walks into a room and people just automatically look at her and say, I want to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> she could go to that, sit, that town that you talked about and they would welcome her because that's who she is. Because you're kind of gregarious. Oh. <laughs> she is. And she lights, she lights up a room. But I think it really is. It's about relationships. And I think we as white people... Um, in general, have to let our guard down and stop being afraid um, of people thinking that we're something that we're not or that we have to go up to people of color and say, I am so sorry. That's not what people are looking for. They want a relationship. Let's talk to people. And like, I want to be part of every community I can be part of. Right. And, and I, like without judging, mm-hmm. you know, if we can let our guards down with each other, let's just talk, have a conversation. It's about equity and, and sharing. Yeah. Um, we, we, we have the scarcity mindset or afraid of relinquishing or letting go of any power. And we don't have the vocabulary to say, let's share. Um, let, let's share what we have because there is so much. And um, so if we can come to conversations, if we can, as Debbie said, let our guard down, if we can um, push fear aside and just be open 
um, to having more conversations. I love the way the brain works because as we, we share each other's stories, we begin to grow this empathic uh, part of our brains and we, we, we begin to put ourselves in other people's shoes and we begin to understand. And that's what restorative practice does. Dina Thompson and Debbie Mulhern, both with the Erie County Restorative Justice Coalition. ECRJC.org? Yes. Great. Thank you so very much for your time. Thank you. Coming up on the program tomorrow, Amy Betros will be here from St. Luke's Mission of Mercy. We'll also have historian and former Buffalo School Board President Barbara Seals Nevergold. A lot to talk about tomorrow. Hope you join us for more discussion right here on WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, WOLN Olean, and WUBJ Jamestown. I'm Dave Devo. Thanks for listening.